Okay, we're starting our live stream. Um, it's been a minute. Uh, this is the Black People in Cryptocurrency live stream. My name is Deidre, and we have a special guest today. We have He's known, most people know him as Bitcoin Zay, as 50% of the team of the Crypto Gentleman, uh, a daily show discussing what's going on in the news in cryptocurrency. Um, all the headlines, they do it Monday through Friday at a set time and on the East Coast at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Um, but recently, uh, Bitcoin Zay has come up with a uh, publisher book. And I'm going to invite him to the live stream now. One second. Hey. Hey, how you doing, DJ? What's going on? The only thing I want to do before we really get started mm -hmm. is to start making sure the shares are going to the group. Because I don't know how many people are paying attention to my timeline. So I'm going to do that now. Okay. Make sure everybody's on the same page. Then you caught me at a time where I had said, I was like, look, it's a lot of things that I want to do with the group. There's a lot of things that are, you know, affecting black people with cryptocurrency and blockchain. Mm -hmm. And I was like, let me just take a hiatus <laughs> from the live stream. And there you go and drop a book. <laughs> so, so much for the hiatus. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to reach my keyboard that I pushed mm -hmm. out the way. So much for my hi hiatus because I was like, there's no way I cannot talk to him directly mm -hmm. about this book. Mm -hmm. So um, let me just Absolutely. make sure this is shared. Yeah. Just going to abbreviate Bitcoin Day. Control copy. All right. So the group should have it. And one more share we're going to do, we're going to do to um, probably the page. So oddly enough, I still find people, the page was kind of an afterthought. I still find people that are in on the page, but not in the group. Oh, yeah. So I was like, all right. All the time. <laughs> oh, people are appearing now. There we go. So they don't pay attention to my timeline. Get <laughs> uh, out of the way. Black people, cryptocurrency. Paste. And post. All right, so everybody's on the same page. Let me do a little brief introduction for people who are watching for the first time. This is a uh, live stream by Black People in Cryptocurrency. We're a Facebook group of about 9,600 members or so now. Um, we also have a page, Black People in Cryptocurrency, that we usually post the archives of the live streams to. So for passers by, so to speak, uh, if they're not aware of what's going on in a group, they at least get a dose of an archive version of the live streams. Mm -hmm. So um, like I was saying before, I, I was taking a bit of a hiatus, focusing on a lot of different projects, a lot of ideas that have come from the discussions of the group. And all of a sudden, I go on Instagram one day and there's a book, <laughs> <laughs> a book. And that book is entitled Bitcoin in Black America. So Bitcoin where would, I would be remiss, there it is, be remiss, if I completely ignore it, say, well, you know, I'm busy. He knows I'm busy with other things. I'm busy with other things, trying to focus on other things. Someone else had to do that. I'd be salty as I don't know what if I didn't get an early interview with Bitcoin Day on this. But before we get to your book, what I want to talk about before, because this is the first time, though, I met you at Black Blockchain Summit last mm -hmm. September. Oh, yeah. um, I stumbled, I, I didn't stumble across uh, the, the crypto gentleman, I, the gentleman of crypto. I, um, interview Sinclair Skinner. Mm -hmm. And because of when I interview people at live stream, you have to friend them. I think it was the day that I had interviewed him or the very, probably the next day, all of a sudden I see him share these two brothers and I'm like, they're talking about crypto. You know, <laughs> what, under what rock have I been under? So that's why I started tuning in then. You didn't even have a name for yourself, but you had done several different episodes. Uh, I know it was where you started in, in 2017, which is the same year that we started uh, Black People in Cryptocurrency. We started in September mm -hmm. 2017. So I was aware that, you know, um, you guys have been doing it for a long time and you have the, the, the fortitude to just do it every single day, which I can't even bring myself to do this like 
you know, on any type of regularity. I've, I've selected mm-hmm. Tuesdays, so that's good, but it could be any time Tuesday. Um, so I want to know about your path. How did you first encounter Bitcoin as Isaiah Jackson, author mm-hmm. of Bitcoin in Black America? And when did that transition into Bitcoin say 50% of the gentleman of crypto with, with King Blood? So okay. give, give us a little bit about your journey. Okay, absolutely. Well, um, as you will read in the book, you'll read a lot more, but I started in 2013. So uh, back in 2013, um, you know, I was a school teacher looking for, you know, different ways to make money. And I heard about Bitcoin from Max Kaiser, who a few people uh, may know Max Kaiser, actually did an interview with him as well, heard about it from him. And his passion is really what kind of drove me to look more into it, because he was so passionate about it. And I had never heard anybody say anything about the Federal Reserve, you know, or anything about, you know, being able to do something different. Uh, You know, so once I I saw that, that kind of got me going with research uh, in 2014 and 15. And then in 2016, me and King actually founded our company, KRBE Digital Assets Group, uh, which is a consulting education group where we actually teach people about Bitcoin, provide educational products such as my Bitcoin starter guide, uh, which I'm on the third version of that now. And uh, also doing the gentleman of crypto daily shows. And like you said before, doing it daily, you got to love it. Uh, trust me, I've been in this this industry a good while. Uh, I haven't really found anybody who has done it as consistent as us. I think we are the longest running daily show uh, mm-hmm. in the world uh, at this point. And maybe a few others, but we're one of the longest running shows daily. And we do try and make sure we get it out every day. Because when most people look for information, they either get snippets of information from different people and piece it together or... They get, you know, two hour podcasts, which some people can't sit through. So we basically wanted to say, hey, every day we put out this this podcast and uh, we put out this show and then people can get onto Bitcoin. So most of the people I was consulting happened to be in the black community, which led me to write this book, Bitcoin in Black America, uh, which is out now on Amazon. And, um, you know, that is where I started and how I got to where I am now. So what do black people need to know about Bitcoin? Because you could have written any book. You guys, you talk about everything. You talk about black people in the space, but you talk about, you know, the full gamut. You're mm-hmm. covering news about what's going on in Asia with Tron. And I mean, you're covering a, a global perspective. So why focus on Bitcoin and black America? What kind of message are you, are, are you delivering in your book? Oh, yeah. Well, the biggest thing I wanted to deliver... Uh, as far as messaging wise, was to send out signals to the black community that, hey, Bitcoin is here. It's not something, you know, fake scam, Ponzi scheme that you may have heard in the news. There are people who are working in the space currently and, you know, you need to join now in order to, you know, ensure survival for the future. And, you know, a lot of black economic groups that I've talked to or that I've heard, a lot of their plans center around uh, different things that have been done before. And I'm just trying to present a new way to maybe move forward in order to help uh, the black community, uh, which includes myself and my family and a lot of my friends. So I had, in my opinion, I almost had a burden on my chest to get this out because I've, I've consulted so many black people over the years. And one of the biggest things was miseducation or no education at all. Just never heard of it, never seen it. And even if you have a Bitcoin book that does have a lot of information, if it's not geared towards the black community or black America, sometimes it'll kind of gloss over it like, oh, well, I'll look at it later. But I think a lot of times when people see Bitcoin in black America, they think, oh, this is written for me and my children and grandkids. And about 80 percent of the book are solutions that can be used across the board. But there are solutions geared directly towards the black community. We have problems in America that are distinctly our own. So I define those problems, those issues and, you know, how crypto can maybe solve it in the future. You mentioned in the backstory that you taught. What did you mm-hmm. teach, and how does that? Uh, is any of that influence how you consult or how you mm-hmm. tell people about uh, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin? Oh yeah. Well, I come from a family of teachers. Actually, my mom, mother's been teaching uh, forty plus years. Grandmother's a teacher. Aunts, uncles, teachers all around. Uh, so I had that background. And when I was teaching, I was teaching high school. Uh, it's funny, I was actually 23 years old. I had a 20-year-old student at the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that was a fun experience. But uh, I was teaching computer engineering and scientific visualization. Um, and there were high school courses that centered around technology, but uh, it was a school that was about 90% black. And a lot of the students there uh, that I would teach, 
a lot of problems they had, I would see it in my peers when I was in high school. Because you got to remember, I was like just in high school when I started teaching. So I kind of picked up on that and started to see exactly how, uh, you know, people in our community are affected with education in general, which led to uh, my style of doing the show and writing now. It's all centered around how I taught students back in the day or how I still te teach people today, breaking it down to the smallest denominator possible so that you can, you know, take it, understand it, and then uh, grow from there uh, with your own research. So I've taken that style and moved it to here because I did the same thing when I taught. Teach a little bit and then give them the resources to research for themselves and it helps a lot more all the way from kids all the way up to adults. Uh, so I've seen that style work and yes, definitely influence how I, how I uh, consult today. Now, your, your degree is in engineering? I mean, mm -hmm. how did that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. you went in and, and tried to bring your skill set into, mm -hmm. but had you worked in technology before you taught? Or what is, what is uh, some of your other career experience? Oh, yeah. Well, that was my first job out of college was teaching. After that, uh, I did IT for a law firm um, for a few years, real estate law firm. So, like I said before, I have a technical background. So, Bitcoin, you know, as a technical thing, I picked up on it a lot faster than other people. Uh, it still was a lot to learn with cryptography and you know <laughs> a few of the other things, but I picked up on it a lot faster than some people because I was doing IT at a law firm and I was doing uh, product engineering uh, at a sign company before that. So I had a couple jobs, first getting out of college uh, when I was like 25 and then discovered Bitcoin in 2013 and basically been working towards the point I am now. And now we in have a book. <laughs> I was about to say, in addition to buying uh, Bitcoin in Black America, what, what, what advice would you give to a novice that just doesn't know anything of mm -hmm. what's going on? You know, what's the fastest way to uh, start getting a, a clue mm -hmm. um, of how to learn what's going on? Oh, yeah. Well, one example is a uh, Bitcoin starter guide that I have. Anybody watching, if you want a quick uh, way to learn about the industry, I have that for you. Um, as well as YouTube and Google are your best friends. Uh, research is your best friend, so to say. Uh, but some people want to know where. Where would I look for research? Where, like, who would I find? Uh, if you look in the book, one of the things I include is a directory in the back. There's literally a whole directory of people and their jobs and where they're located. So those people you can reach out to. Uh, you can actually look them up and see what information they're providing uh, because it's a whole list of black people in blockchain. I know there are some that are missing, but there's at least, uh, I believe it's 45 people on that list. So there's at least 45 resources for you to look to start as far as information, including myself. Like I said, I can send you a starter guide, YouTube as far as different channels. Uh, those are good ways to start. And then to continue, of course, you'll find your niche, you'll find what you like, and then you can go from there. Because some people may be miners, some people may be traders, some people may be just long-term holders who want to know about technology. You can find that niche in this market. Uh, just got to know where to start. What, what there was a, a quote that I came across, mm -hmm. um, I, I think it was a couple of days ago. I'll be a little bit remiss because I don't remember who stated it, it was on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. But the person basically said that, in their opinion, crypt, uh, cryptocurrency investing was the least interesting thing about you know Bitcoin and yeah. cryptocurrency. So, I say that to say, what, what about this sector um, excites you? What have you run across and said, ah. This really hits a part, a part of a problem to kind of give people a, a perspective on the difference between technology in general mm -hmm. and what blockchain and, and cryptocurrency bring to change that dynamic. Oh, yeah. Well, I think who uh, that quote, whoever said that quote is absolutely right. I even, you know, most of the first chapter is explaining how I went from getting into the industry for the price and then staying for the technology. The most interesting thing I've seen um, in this industry that I actually want to test for future is the ability to mine cryptocurrency and harness the heat from that uh, cryptocurrency mining and grow plants and food. Um, there's actually a guy in Canada who's doing it right now. Uh, he has a, a short video, I believe, online. But it's almost an, an untapped, I mean, nobody's even tried it or thought of it. And I believe it, it solves two problems at once. And uh, for one, you can mine cryptocurrency and make money monthly. And also you can grow healthy food choices, which I know uh, health as well. As much as I can talk about crypto all day, Bitcoin, let's have generational wealth, doesn't mean anything if everybody's dying at 50, you know, from not having a, a healthy food options. So I think that is probably the most interesting uh, project. And I think in the black community, uh, long term, we've seen terrible banking practices, along with we've seen terrible food practices, a lot of uh, food deserts, a lot of areas 
where it's not available as well as our diet passed down through generations. So that's the number one most interesting one I've seen. Uh, also, too, one very interesting use case I did put in the book is for black churches. Uh, I believe black churches are the epicenter of most black communities. There's one on every, I mean, literally every black community I've gone in every city, there's at least one big church on the corner, uh, if not multiple. Uh, my grandma, I, I used to joke, my grandmother lives in a town of maybe a thousand people. They have four churches on one street. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not like this is new to a lot of black people, but if the church comes out and states, hey, we want to basically uh, gather digital gold, much like the Catholic church gathered, you know, physical gold, we want to gather it with Bitcoin, then we can start to see those generational changes, you know, if we don't have corruption, of course, we can see those generational changes uh, with money because what it does is transparency. I know people are tired of the pastor or whoever running off with the money. Transparency is one. Voting, the ability to take in money and then people in the church vote on what it actually goes without having to leave the house, without having to do anything. Uh, and blockchain smart contracts take care of it just like that. So I think those are two of the most interesting things for the black community going forward. And like uh, Michelle commented, crypto botany, I think that's very, very tight. Yeah, I've not been looking at the things because it's a little <laughs> distant for me. Uh, yeah, I, wish oh, yeah. I love that crypto botany mm -hmm. and keep the church financially accountable as well. What do you mm -hmm. what do you say to some people that, um, you know, I, I find it prevalent in our community too. There seems to be a, a, a resistance. You have your own show. You, you do your show daily. Mm -hmm. You were King Bless. And then someone says, well, Forbes says, Bloomberg <laughs> says, yeah, yeah. MSNBC says, yep. you know, how, how have you two been able to counteract what your experiences and what your information you're getting from mm -hmm. your sources? How have you been able to counter that dialogue to kind of get people to kind of resonate with that there seems to be, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what do you, what do you think about that division between mm -hmm. people constantly quoting Forbes, Bloomberg, other things, but you have your show, but they're like, well, you're not on Forbes, Bloomberg. Or... Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, one thing that I always remind people when they look at these media, different medias, I always say we have receipts. That's the one thing about our show. We'll report on something they said a year ago and they'll be completely dead wrong. They'll flip it and then a year later people will go with it with Forbes, MSNBC, we've seen that, CNBC, we've seen that plenty of times. So we have receipts. We basically have the proof to show you that they don't know what they're talking about. Also, one of the things that I always point out to people is when you look at the media and you see how they put Bitcoin into the, uh, or how they represent Bitcoin in the media, I always tell them, doesn't that seem familiar? Haven't they misrepresented Bitcoin or, or black people the same way they've misrepresented Bitcoin over the years? It shouldn't seem familiar. Uh, it should be basically... Uh, match made in heaven because we realize, yeah, that we've been misrepresented a lot in the media before, even though we know it's not true. Why wouldn't they do the same with Bitcoin? Because it is technically the opponent of the banking industry owns these uh, journal these uh, these different publications. So uh, that and also too, I mean, I'm not trying to flex on anybody or say anything, but a lot of the writers of these articles I've met before, they ask me for advice. They don't know really anything. They literally are asking people like myself about the industry and then they go and write stories based on what we tell them. I've met writers from New York, met writers out here in LA that write for Forbes, Bloomberg, all of them, and they ask me. So trust me, <laughs> it's me and like it's a few other people, they ask me for the information. So they write whatever they want, but they, they literally don't know uh, a crypto like we do. And like I said, we have the receipts. We're on episode 438. Uh, that's hours and hours of, of episodes and we do it live. We made sure we did it live because Anybody can piece together a nice box together presentation, have something written and just read it off. We're answering questions on literally on the go as we go. And we've been doing it for two years. So uh, through a bull market, bear market, bull market again, doesn't matter. We're here. Forbes and all of them, they, they are not. So uh, we definitely have those receipts. Yeah, I, 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 have, I mean, you mentioned a lot of journalists contacting you mm -hmm. and asking you for um, information. What, do, what about the black media? Have mm -hmm. any reached out to you and I'm, I'm about you know, what they should be running in there. Um, uh, especially, in, I mean, the book, it's been released now, like it's been like what, it's in internet time, it's been forever. It's been like 10 it's, years internet time. <laughs> but has, in, in the real world, it's been like about a week or two weeks? Yep, uh, about a week, a little over a week. Yep. About, uh, a little over a week, but it, that's like, that's, that's basically the internet time, here. that's forever. I, uh, what, I mean, have, how has been the reception? I mean, you, you have the lone book, that's mm -hmm. it. Mm-hmm. 
Um, have you been getting responses from Black Enterprise or anybody querying from Black media? Uh, about well, what's I, going I got reached out. Uh, I, I was reached out to by somebody from Black Enterprise this time around last year, uh, but I don't have enough followers. Um, that's it. <laughs> uh, so that's Black Enterprise. Some of the other publications, they said the same thing. They want people with a lot of followers, with a huge following, uh, which I'm in the tech world. If we wanted to look like we had 1,000, 20, 40, 50,000, we could do it. I mean, we could buy, we could pay for followers. We could change it. We could do yeah. what we wanted. However, we, we don't. We, a lot of us don't pay for followers. I, we've never exactly. black people in cryptocurrency never run an ad. Never, never run an ad. Nothing. People we have are, hijacked our name, I and know, that I, led to that. a boost of people joining our group because they were confused. Mm -hmm. But other than that, we've never we've not solicited yeah. like that. Um, do you have any and, you know or, ideas on how how we remedy that problem? Because I feel that I mean my own personal opinion is that mm -hmm. the black press of all types, mm -hmm. not just singling out black enterprise, but all of them are not f covering blockchain. Yeah. Period. I mean, it's very intimate. Not at all. You have I mean, a, a few few writers that are, are, are trying, but as a coming from a publication, mm -hmm. you know, head of understanding it is a there's a new sheriff in town, so to speak. Um, they're not really producing the content they could be producing. Yeah. I mean, so and, ideas and I, on, I agree completely. I I haven't seen as much, even in my research, Bitcoin and black people or blockchain or what, there's maybe three articles written directly towards it. It was one in Forbes like a year or two ago, but it was like question based, like should black people use Bitcoin? You know what I mean? It wasn't like a yes. actual explanation. So one of the things I've seen with these publications is they are still a business. So the people that they bring in, they want them to be popular. The problem is in our industry, being popular mostly means you're just a marketer. It doesn't necessarily, you know, there are a few people that have gone on to be popular very, very few, but the really smart people in this industry, we're, we've grown organically. Everything has been organic. We've done it straight from the ground. We started with zero followers. <laughs> Trust me, we didn't do anything you know, crazy except give out good information. But I think the way we can solve it uh, is support from people like doing shows like this interview uh, to get those numbers up for people like myself who do it organically versus some of the other people who I don't really want to name any names, but there are some people uh, who have artificially inflated their numbers to make themselves seem more important. And these publications continually put out what they say, which uh, if I ever debated any of these people or if we were ever in the same room, it wouldn't even be a contest. But that is what they look for, numbers. I think that will change uh, simply because I do have a lot of speaking engage engagements lined up over the next few months uh, so they can finally hear, hear a real person talk about it and not some pie in the sky dreams that most people <laughs> talk about. Uh, so yeah, I think I think that, that's slowly changing, but it takes time. Uh, we've where, decided. To where, take what are some speaking engagements you have coming up? Uh, some of the speaking engagements. Uh, August third, I'll be in Atlanta for the State of the Black Dollar. That'll be nationally televised. Uh, not sure all the ins and outs. I will have that information out more. Um, in late August, uh, I should be in Colorado and Denver for Andres Antonopoulos uh, conference as well. Maybe speaking, oh, wow. but I'll I'll probably be there in attendance either way. Um, in September, of course, Black Blockchain Summit, uh, September 8th and 9th, and then Sacramento at the end of, of September. And there'll be dates in between. So uh, I'll put out a whole list of dates if people want to see. And then also, too, uh, just recently accepted um, an invitation to speak at the Crypto Dinner Club, October 3rd, if you've ever heard about them. Uh, no, I haven't. I was going to say the Crypto Dinner Club is a $2,500 a plate event, and <laughs> I will be presenting... <laughs> I will be presenting in front of them. In fact, some the, good chicken. Exactly. <laughs> in fact, the only way you can get into this dinner is if you send evidence of a million dollars in a Bitcoin wallet. So those are the type of people I'll be talking to wow. over the next over the next few months. These are the type of crowds I'll be talking to. So trust me, um, they're starting to see the real because what happened? This is what happened. 2017, nobody knew anything, mostly mainstream. So they were just jumping, grasping at straws. Whoever seemed like they knew, they were totally grasping. Then 2018 came. And all these influencers and all these people who supposedly were in the crypto industry just went away. And me and King used to laugh because we were like, it'll happen naturally. It, it, it'll clean itself out. Either the industry will right. do it. So now 2019, people are looking and say, okay, now who was here throughout all of this? You know, all because a lot of people came in 2017. So they're like, all right, so who was here during that bull market? Then they were here during the bear market and they're still here today. It's, it's like us and two other people, three other people. Right. Um, uh, so it's, that's, that's what I'm start. That's what I'm starting to see now is we're, we're getting recognized and 
we'll be uh we'll be up there just like other people in stature in my opinion but it takes more time we didn't go the easy route so i understand it, it's gonna take some time yeah and it, i think it's important that you know especially your daily show mm -hmm. but also getting out the message that you know a lot of the predictions that we are making in the sector aren't us trying to be marketers and trying yeah. to toot our own horns it's because we can understand and at least i can understand about 70 percent of a white paper but i can understand when because i understand i read the the bitcoin white paper and understand things like anton antonopoulos and mm -hmm. other people and their conception of of blockchain being both the technology mm -hmm. and actually a form of democracy, a computerized democracy, because I understand that, then I can read other people's kind of hybrid presentations or mm -hmm. not even hybrid presentations. You're, you're, you're using the vocabulary of blockchain and cryptocurrency, but basically you're putting out something that could have any bank could have put out before yeah. uh, 2009. So um, I think it, uh, that kind of influences a lot of times what I, I, I prefer to write than to do this. Mm -hmm. um, but I start when I start, the reason why I started the live streams is that ultimately I had hoped that of all the people that I interviewed, that someone bigger would see it and say, hey, I need to talk to Serena Hines. Hey, mm -hmm. I need to talk to whatever, because these are, these are serious interviews. This mm -hmm. is not, you know, people talking fluff and, 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 and just Bitcoin, 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 <laughs> Bitcoin, blockchain. Everything I mean, we, is, don't, yeah. we don't really do that. We, t we talk about <laughs> you know, a range of different solutions that, you know, black entrepreneurs are trying to, to start and yourself as an author and also mm -hmm. as a media personnel covering like the whole spectrum. <laughs> I'm hoping that in the long run, the black press will get off of its, you know, you know, exclusive. Basically, I feel that they're, they're missing the opportunity yeah. to create mm -hmm. the, the black pundits. Mm -hmm for even the white mainstream to pick up because yeah. we understand why MSNBC doesn't call us or CNBC or wh whatever, uh, Bloomberg. We understand why they don't. They mm -hmm. call their own mm -hmm. um, nine times out of 10. Um, but when you have black press that d ignores you <laughs> and you're not talking foolishness and you're not talking nonsense, yeah. then that becomes problematic. Because I always felt that they missed the boat. They're, they're still missing the boat. I mean, honestly, the person that should have been on the cover of Black Enterprise in 2019 was was definitely, because at, at least he was making the media rounds mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of technology, definitely should have been Arthur Hayes. I mean, yeah. Arthur Hayes I, is a big know, name. Someone, and he's, he's not even mentioned. There's no, one big, there's no one bigger than him. There's no one bigger. And it, it sucks that Black media hasn't called No him one white him. bigger than him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The There's biggest no probably one in the industry, yeah. So, and it's it's amazing. That's why I, I wrote the book because it wasn't like I was saying, "Hey, pay attention to us." What I'm saying is, black people are, are doing great, and we're gonna make you pay attention to us. You just need to get on with it. So, Arthur Hayes is a great example. I mean, it's people doing it. Like you said, Sinclair Skinner has been killing it. Reggie Same. Middleton, a lot of these big names that were at the Black Blockchain Summit, uh, Alakani. Um, the Bitcoin lady, like it's so many great yeah. people in the industry yeah. that, that are killing it. And it's like, they just miss, they, they just kind of gloss over it. But I am not surprised because a lot of these black publications are, they have black writers, uh, they have some black editors in there, but they're not giving out a black message. And I think part of our message, uh, as far as finances and things of that, that nature, uh, when it comes to Bitcoin to them is too risky. Um, a lot of times people don't want to admit it, but there are black people who don't really believe in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency because they've been tainted by what the media has told them. And if they work in media and they're constantly told, well, this is what it really is, then that view can kind of be skewed. But usually when I meet these people in person, five minute conversation, their, their mind changes because they're like, nobody ever told me that. And I'm like, I know they're not going to. <laughs> Why would they? I, I mean, there's a lot of smart people who are probably watching this right now whose first thought when they heard of Bitcoin is, why didn't I hear that already? Or, you know, why, why haven't I been involved? I'm like, trust me, there's a coordinated effort to make sure retail investors can't change their lives for the better because that gives you more freedom, especially in the black community. We've already seen, I mean, threats from CIA, FBI, where the biggest threat to the U.S. is organized uh, black community. So if there's money uh, that can organize us, then this is the way. Let's do it. And 
the black media just got to catch up at some point. They will. Hopefully it's not too late. Uh, that's why I called my first chapter last to the party. Because that is, I do, I don't want to, I don't want to have to say I told you so. I really don't want to have to say that um, at some point. So hopefully they do catch up and we'll see. Hopefully this book will do it. Once again, Bitcoin in Black America. And everybody who's watching this, mm -hmm. you know, everybody, you know, people will see this later. Mm -hmm. You know, there's few people watching it now. But everybody's connected to some celebrity, somebody. Mm -hmm. You need to tell them that there are a slew of black people. There's a, there's a, a link that I posted on my wall. I didn't discover it until uh, I think Eduardo Jackson sent me a message mm -hmm. saying, did you see this? This woman put up this link in, in April. Mm. And I tell you, I think I only know like a third of the people on the list. I, but she went scouring, mm -hmm. saying because because they there was a blog, uh, what was it a blockchain circle? Something had mm -hmm. said that they 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 could they had a hundred faces of blockchain and there wasn't a black face in there. Yeah. And so she went scouring and started and has my profile picture. Hope another people. Like, but I, if I had if she had tagged somebody, I surely would have shared it in April. Mm -hmm. But I didn't even know it existed. But to show you that it's even bigger, and one time I was drafting a list, I had a list of like maybe I stopped at like about 36 only because I stopped going through my LinkedIn to figure mm -hmm. out who I connected to and who I don't even talk to. But I knew they were in blockchain or I knew they were in cryptocurrency in some facet. And then you have Black Blockchain Summit, which going into year two at Howard University coming in September. But that first year, the, the, the more than 100 so people that it pulled out. Mm -hmm. There's just so many black people in this space oh, yeah. that it's a shame that we have to piggyback off of our association with a celebrity that doesn't know anything about crypto. Mm -hmm. But we need to merge the two things together. Oh, yeah. Because the other disheartening aspect is that when you see celebrities, when they finally get an idea and then they go to Europe. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I'm going to bring Amsterdam to. <laughs> To, to, to West Africa, and we're going to do this thing, and we're all sitting here like, you know, what are we, chopped liver? Yeah, exactly. We're not, we're not yeah, invisible, we're and yeah, we're exactly. not new to this. <laughs> yeah, so I, there has to be some type of shift or change that, fine, Black Enterprise, uh, any any Black publication, they need mm -hmm. a celebrity tie-in, fine. We'll give you a freaking celebrity tie-in, but we're going to talk about the real solution True. across borders, happening in the Caribbean, happening in uh, Al-Khalani is in Botswana. Mm -hmm. You have Kwame, uh, Kwame uh, yep. what's his last name? Ratonga? Ratonga? Yeah. Ah, oh, it's been his last name. Kwame is with the Ugandan Blockchain Association, the, kid, mm -hmm. the guy that graduated from Harvard. So we've got like some sharpshooters between Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, Ghana. I have all those contacts from Black Blockchain Summit that every once in a while I might talk to, mm -hmm. in addition to the United States. In addition to Trinidad and Tobago, in addition to Haiti, in addition to we're all, we're all very few degrees away from each other mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of our connections, but all of us are suffering. I think I just I just found out yesterday. Okay, in 2018, of all the, the blockchain conferences in, in Africa, it was Uganda, it was Nigeria, it was uh, Ghana, I believe, of course South Africa. Um, but of all the conferences that occurred in 2018, not one black company won any of the, the pitch competitions in 2018. Hmm. But in 2019, we got one. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Just, yeah, but that, that shows you how tragic it is, yeah. how bad it is. So as much as we complain in the United States, of uh, you know, and we shouldn't complain, you hmm. know, if you do the numbers. You know, Black America, according to the 2010 census, is 42 million people. Mm -hmm. At 42 million people, that makes us the 11th largest African nation. Yep. And yet, we don't have a Google. Mm -hmm. We don't have a Facebook. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we don't, we don't, there's no brand that, that is us in, yep. in, in technology. There's really nothing. There's some independent people that have done well. Mm -hmm. uh, either if have been CEOs of company, um, we get, had Emmett McHenry with Network Solutions and stuff, and he made a killing selling yeah. it. There's been individuals who have done well, but we don't have anything that is ours. And blockchain and cryptocurrency is that new chance because yeah. it's as new as dentistry is to the rest of medicine. <laughs> so yeah. I think people also get confused. They hear, oh, it's technology. All technology is the same. 
but technology has sections and divisions like anything else. Oh, so yeah. imagine if dentistry had never existed before and boom, now it's here. Well, mm -hmm. now we have blockchain and cryptocurrency. It's a new paradigm, a new dynamic in which new companies are coming out of. Mm -hmm. And to give some perspective, and I know I'm kind of monopolizing your time, and I do want people to, to my last question to you is coming up in a minute. Mm -hmm. But to give people some perspective, you had uh, Sean Wilkinson out of Morehouse mm -hmm. conceive out of his own mind something that had never existed before, which is a storage system or blockchain that, that would rival um, Dropbox. Yep. But it also allowed people with personal computers like you, me, anybody in Kenya, a little phone, whatever, to be able to sell storage space on our personal computers for and it's locked off from us so we can't see it that we can make a revenue from mm -hmm. it so that was the basic the main concept of decentralized storage yeah now if you've been to storage recently i don't know if you noticed there's a name change yeah i heard they rebranded what is it now it's something called tardy grade it's i think that's the stupidest name ever but tardy mm. grade because wow. you no know, tardy means late i don't know what grade means but there's also a new interim CEO. Mm. So there's issues now. Yeah. Now, maybe the reason why he, we have not seen Sean, but people can look Sean, S-H-A-W-N, yes. Wilkinson, you know how to spell it. You can look, see old interviews of him. So this is something that this, a black person created. All of a sudden now, within the last two weeks, we're seeing a new name hmm. and he's not the CEO anymore. But to show, give you some perspective of how profound his concept is, one of the top funded blockchain companies Filecoin. is a company called Filecoin. I know. That, at $257 million. <laughs> wow. Yep. And they haven't delivered So here you've anything. got a black kid out of Morehouse that years from now, people will say he was the innovator or something. Mm -hmm. But all we can say is we couldn't help him stay where he is because we're not funding his business. That's not where his funding comes from. And I'm sorry if you get white BC funding and we're looking for funding. We're looking, mm -hmm. I've not even talked about the, the project that you, I and others are, are working on together. Mm -hmm. We're looking for funding. And to be honest with you, we will probably more than likely get funding from white people than from black people. Unfortunately, it's, it's tragic as it is. That's how it feels. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at somebody that we could not protect with his own conception of his idea, but we know it's a fantastic idea because white people are funding it to the tune of $257 million for something that was an idea that they copied from him and he yeah. had his launched and working. And I don't think Falcon, I think Falcon launched it in, last year, right? 2018? Yeah. They haven't done anything since 2017. They haven't uh, done anything. They've talked in front of the Senate. Mon and I, and I think they're, they're associated with Stanford, right? I is he Stanford or MIT? Yeah, with some school, yeah. Some school, it's a, yeah, it's an accelerated one of like a project that we're working on. So oh. if you think white people are not funding, and it's not all white people, it's specific to the best. Stanford, MIT, mm -hmm. uh, Cornell's in the mix uh, to some extent. Berkeley's awesome, absolutely yeah. in the mix. So if you're not paying attention that these elite schools of funding to the tunes of tens and millions of dollars concept and idea stage businesses that is proof that bitcoin and cryptocurrency is incredibly important because these are the same schools that fin that finance the companies we use now google facebook yep amazon well amazon to some extent mm -hmm. so that's the kind of message that we're we're, we're we're trying to send out to wake up um and there's a reason why I, um Isaiah Jackson has his book. You can look for it on Amazon. Oh, yeah. Um, it's called Bitcoin and Black America. How can people contact you and reach out to you? What's the best way of, of, of reaching out to you to learn more about what you guys are doing um, and to actually uh, get your book? Oh, yeah. Well, the best way to reach out would be uh, at, on Twitter, uh, Bitcoin Zay. Um, on there is great uh, Facebook as well. Uh, Zay Jackson, um, but our YouTube channel, like we said, Daily Show, The Gentleman of Crypto, you can catch us there uh, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. So that's a way to see us every single day. Uh, if you reach out uh, through any of these avenues, you can email uh, me as well, or I'll get your email and uh, I can, you know, send you a digital copy of the book to review it uh, or, you know, a starter guide to get you going. 
Uh, so those are the different ways to contact me. Um, you know, going forward, I do want to harp on the point that you made last with the funding. Um, that story with Sean is one of the stories I use uh, or something to that effect of how black companies can come out and not have funding. The same idea will get taken and then somebody will raise millions of dollars, uh, whether it's white, Asian, whoever, any other community outside of black community. That's literally what happens. Um, so when people try to say, you know, it's Bitcoin's for everybody, it's, you shouldn't, you know, single it down to black people. I'm sorry. I've seen too many examples of the same thing that happened before happening again. And if we're going to stop it from happening, I do have to hone in on the black community to understand, like, hey, we need to fund each other. We need to help each other. Or if we get funding from outside uh, communities, whatever, that's fine. You need to use it in order to build products for ourselves. So blockchain, I do want to discuss that. That is the project that I will be working on from after, you know, after all of this, you know, tour and stuff. I'll be working on that for uh, the longest period from here on out. Peer-to-peer -peer loans and crowdfunding for black-owned businesses, uh, businesses, any type of business, but it will be a focus on black-owned business because, like you said, funding is the number one thing. We are not, you know, devoid of ideas. We have amazing ideas, amazing people working on it. However, funding is the biggest thing. And when you have statistics such as 1% of all venture capitalist funds goes to <laughs> black business owners, 0.2% of that goes to black women. That's terrible. That's that's horrible. Now. I think it's point. I think it's point zero zero two something. Yeah, it wasn't even point two. Yeah, like when I read that, I was like, oh great, that does not go well. Yeah. So see, if you're missing what he's saying because this is new, and I'm sorry, I'm stuck in a cough drop, but mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of my allergies and humidity is bothering me. Um, black chain. Mm -hmm. That is a, 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 a online venture. He's working with open source software to allow people to go in and uh, investors to go in and actually link with founders. Of course, any type of startup, not just a technology yep. startup. Yep. Uh, funding is a, a tremendous issue, mm -hmm. not just in technology, with black businesses in general. And that data that he's spitting out, I think it comes from Undivided. As a matter of fact, it's what Elizabeth Warren used in a kind of a promotion a couple of weeks ago. So a campaign promise was that, that uh, uh, people of color and women-owned businesses, especially black women-owned businesses, Latino-owned mm -hmm. businesses, Native American-owned businesses, that we should be able to uh, get flat-out grants. Yeah. Uh, because the numbers are so abysmal, it's 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 uh what two was it two two percent of people of color or yeah something like that, that was people of color yeah, and then black people is and even then, lower and yeah. then black people is one percent. Yeah, one percent. Get funded. Black, yeah. So one percent of all those, and then of black women-led uh, uh, ventures, it's I think like point zero zero two six. I mean, it's really it's practically very, very non-existent. Yeah. And, and and it's important to note that um, uh, Isaiah is, is his blockchain is one of the companies that's associated with black people in cryptocurrency. We have a a deck, mm -hmm. um, which a, a lot of the, the blockchain startups were banding together. Mm -hmm. to bring awareness that we are looking for funding. Mm -hmm. And then we have, uh, we mentioned that, uh, I just mentioned that Filecoin was being uh, invested to the tune of $257 million. But Filecoin is one of several com companies, including Stellar um, and, and several others that are being basically incubated at the top universities in technology in the nation. So mm -hmm. MIT, Berkeley College, uh, Stanford, all these different schools are essentially providing the, um, you know, intellectual resources mm -hmm. to make sure that these uh, private ventures excel. And what we want to do with Black people in cryptocurrency is create a Black people in cryptocurrency accelerator. And we've actually reached out to the only blockchain, blockchain lab and an HBCU, which is at Howard University, um, mm -hmm. HU Blockchain Lab. And what we want to do is to be able to support them in recruiting students and providing programming, but them also in turn support the, the startups in the same capacity as existing already uh, at MIT, Berkeley, and other places. There's no reason why we can't do what they're doing. Um, and, and we don't want to seem like the, the field is antagonistic. It really is not. Mm. We've reached out to um, Berkeley uh, uh, College and uh, HU uh, Blockchain Lab already has a relationship with them. A lot, a lot of the schools, a lot of the academics are really open, and they're like, "Go for it, go for it," because they got their funding. They got their funding from their alumni. Mm -hmm. They've got their funding from um, VCs that probably were alumni. 
Um, so we need to replicate this model at HBCUs. It brings mm -hmm. a potent dynamic of uh, curricula that can actually promote and, and recruit students who actually want to uh, study and work in long term in blockchain. And then it gives the startups that kind of support um, that we don't ordinarily get. We don't always constantly want to be put into a position where, okay, great, we started a great company, but because all of our VC funding is coming from white investors and they've got their friends, you know, that's going to be your CTO and that's going to be your this, because if they bring the cheese, you know, they're they going to bring, they gonna bring the mice too. Yep. So, and then all of a sudden there's a squeeze play and then you're, 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 you're out of the own com your own company that you conceived and that you started. So we need to improve the dialogue. So everyone who's watching, definitely tell them about Isaiah Jackson's book. That's his government. Mm -hmm. Isaiah Jackson, what we know also as Bitcoin Zay. Yep. He's got uh, Bitcoin and Black America is his book. Tell people to go get it. Oh, yeah. You know, buy it for a celebrity friend. Send it to them. Say, you know, they keep repeating. There's this whole huge Black community mm -hmm. of blockchain and technologists. They're looking to... to link up and um yep we are here. It, you know we're, we're 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 open to teach oh yeah you know no one I, I honestly i'm surprised that you actually got people i don't i don't, I don't really get people who um in my i get people from my group mm -hmm. that may uh inbox me and ask me questions behind the scenes mm -hmm. or ask me to look at something they've written or said or something and and does that have any input but i don't get um most of my LinkedIn requests mm -hmm. are from Indian Asians and Russians, which is yep. interesting. Oh yeah. yeah uh, I do global. a lot of mm -hmm. requests of black people <laughs> in the space, mm -hmm. but most of the people that are talking to me behind the scenes is this guy named Jay Best out of the UK. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't really get a lot of surprising, a lot of black people um, yeah. that contact and ask questions, but I think that they I, need to I will know. say too, you know what's sad is unfortunately with writing this book, there are people outside of our community who care more about the black community using Bitcoin than black people. Yeah. Unfor I mean, there are literally black people who when I bring up the name of the book or the plight of black blockchain, they'll say, well, you know, I don't want to divide and I don't want to And I'm trying to explain to them that you are basically a product of uh, guilt. They have basically guilted you into thinking you're not supposed to help your own community while everyone helps their own community. <laughs> like right. you're basically going against the grain. Like it's not like you're racist. It's not like you're not open to other uh, communities. We I'm open to everybody. What I'm saying is Every other community understands that in order to be strong and to have some sort of leverage in the economy, you have to have an industry or something that makes you viable. What what gives black people leverage right now? Sports and and, uh, and entertainment. That's what gives us leverage. Right. That's unfortunate because we have very smart people. We have a lot of people around the world who are in the technology field who don't you know get uh, the proper due. And one thing I want to make sure black people understand is that in our community. Yes, you can focus. You can say the word black. There's some people that don't even want to say the word black people. Like they just want to say, well, people of color, well, you know, African American. All right, whatever, whatever. You understand what we're saying. Understand that there has to be a concerted effort to help in the future or to work as a community in the future. And, you know, a lot of times I have to deal with those type of people, but it's all good. They'll figure it out at some point. Um, because when the median wealth of black people has stayed the same for 50 years and all these other ideas have been tried, it's time to try something new. Uh, just, and it, let's just try. And you have to realize that blockchain is going to impact um, the entertainment sector. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's or, we already we have in our deck what mm -hmm. at least two two products. There's one my, mine that I don't really talk about that much. Um, mm -hmm. Milked. It's a it's a it's a revenue stream based um, for for media for all kinds of media producers film new uh, uh, print printed news or whatever, written mm -hmm. word. Um, and then you have Eduardo Jackson's cinema draft that yep. can be used to leverage a whole lot of things if he had the right uh, entertainment partner. Um, not only is it the entertainment revenue stream, but it can also you know, be used to, 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 to fundraise yeah, uh, and, to and, and gameplay even. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's so many disruptions that are coming <laughs> to the entertainment and sports. Uh, there was Ray Austin that I interviewed before with Fan Control Football League. So mm -hmm. the, the, they're across right. the board, 
there needs to be questions, even from the areas that we do well in or that we, you know, excel in, in terms of, of you know, participating in, of what's coming down the pike. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they're not going to be prepared and they're going to assume that Black people are not create, capable of executing these things when we are. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think we can I, already, I see, already see five, six years hence of, of what, what's coming down because we're constantly reading what's going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think we've already seen the evidence of what we can do uh, throughout American history. You know, American history is black history. So we've seen yeah. how we've impacted. We've seen, you know, what we can do. The future is ours to take. That's that's the thing is at this point, we can basically stop the the, the whole brainwash process of, you know, black people can't do this, can't do that. Bitcoin is open. To, it's, it's borderless. Anybody can use it. Those days are done. The excuses are pretty much over. And sometimes, you know, some of my friends laugh at me. I tell people all the time and say, hey, you got about two or three more years of me trying to convince or trying to tell people or teach people. And then you're just not going to see me anymore. Like I'm going to be in some other country <laughs> somewhere. And I think a lot of people are starting to feel like that because uh, this this is what I, I like to call sort of the last stand, uh, because if we don't have a, a, a strategy for this industry going into the future, that's a hundred more years of us going through the same old, same old. Like, I don't think people understand the urgency. That's also why I shortened the book. I wanted people to be able to read this book in one or two sittings and then start. I want people to get caught up in reading for, you know, three weeks and then never actually get into it. I actually want it to be straight to the point for that reason, because there is a timestamp on the amount of uh, wealth creation we have and the industry we can we can create. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for the future simply because I know the people who need to hear it will hear it uh, and will apply it. And then some of the other people, of course, they'll ignore it, but they won't have a choice. Um, you know, a lot of people, some people are kind of taken aback when I say that, that you won't have a choice. But I'll just give you a quick example. You know, I had an uncle who works for a bank. He's been working there for 20 something years. Didn't want to hear anything about crypto, Bitcoin at all. Never. He just was like, nah, it's, it's whatever. Um, come to find out. Uh, a few months ago, Bank of America is making their employees learn about cryptocurrency. He has to go to a cryptocurrency uh, teaching se a seminar to learn about it when he had a nephew who could have taught him everything five years ago. So that's what I mean when I tell people, you're not going to have a choice. I'm trying to help you, but you're not going to have a choice. You're going to have to need to learn, know it. And for those of you out there who are lawyers, accountants, engineers, even teachers, uh, familiarize yourself so you can be in a position to be ahead of other people. I mean, it's, I'm tired of people waiting for it to, you know, catch up. Like, oh, I'll wait for it to. No, no, no. You can be ahead of the game already. So, uh, yeah, definitely <clears throat> pushing that forward, especially in the black community. If you want funding, uh, you know, long term, we got to be uh, innovative. And I think we have been and we will continue to be with Bitcoin and blockchain going forward. Yeah, there's a psychological block that we have to counter. Um, mm -hmm. I was trying to. Sometimes I, I I write a lot of stuff about Kemet and Kush and everything like that. And I've been I've been doing that since I was eight years old. It's just easy for me. Study it, you know, growing up in New York and watching Gil Nobles like it is, and then mm -hmm. going on to read uh, Shake Out the D up and stuff in high school. Then I end up minoring in ancient African studies, so it comes off easy. Then I join some groups online, and I have a whole circle of, of people behind the scenes that uh, we talk about a lot of things, we debate a lot of things behind the scenes and we share information. And then we, I have a men of several groups and I have articles on Quora. And someone said to me, well, a lot of times the, 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 the Kemet people don't know that I write, talk about blockchain and the blockchain people don't know I talk about Kemet <laughs> stuff, even though I use yeah. the same name. But someone said to me, uh, in one of the history things, we were debating something and they said, why do you always waste your time with this? Because, you know, we need to talk about now and what matters. Mm -hmm. And my thing was, if you cannot conceptualize based on all the data I can provide from genetic studies of human remains, mm -hmm. from the Remetch's uh, own writings about themselves, and there's several different artifacts that you can point to where they talk about their ancestors having come from the South, Mm -hmm. from all the things that Africans still do that are in those artifacts, from using red okra and yellow okra, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the skin coloring, from the musical instruments that only exist in Africa, from um, the, the way they, the, the pick, Afro picks, the curling yep. sticks, the butter in the hair, all this stuff, the jewelry, everything that I can tie in 
can't, if you can't conceive that Kemet was a hundred percent like Uganda, you know, indigenous Ugandans or indigenous Kenyans or indigenous Botswana, or because that's literally who they were. If you do the yeah. look at the Amarna study, it's hitting the Great Lakes, mm -hmm. and it's hitting indigenous South Africans between those two regions, the Great Lakes, the Tanzania, the Kenya, the Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. to indigenous South Africans, Namibians, South Africa, whatever, Botswana, uh, Zimbabwe, to West Africans, third. It's those three regions that are hit before any other part of Africa. Then it hits the rest of Africa, North mm -hmm. Africa, East Africa, and then it goes out the continent. If you cannot conceive that black people were the end all and be all of everything until the Ptolemies from the start, then you cannot conceive of a black person being expert at blockchain. Yeah. And that kind of is that resistance that you're getting from no, 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 no. And then all of a sudden they hear something from a white company mm. or Forbes starts to talk about it. Then it becomes important. Mm. And all of a sudden is this, oh, well, I guess you kind of sort of knew, but I'm getting this source from X, Y, Z. And that, yeah, that kind of like how it impacts all of us. Yeah, I've heard that too many times. After hearing from such and such, yeah. Now it makes sense, and I'm like, hold on, hold on. You mean to, you mean to tell me the dude that I taught? I, 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 I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you like straight up. There is a, a guy that actually taught about cryptocurrency, 2015, and he kind of learned, you know, along the way. White guy. He taught his friends, and then some of their friends uh, that he knew, they came to a conference in Charlotte, and uh, you know, I was just kind of standing around. They were talking about stuff, and I was saying how I was supposed to be on the panel, and the guy was like. Why? Like, why would you be on the panel? Like, what, what, what would you speak about or whatever? And I was like, well, uh, the dude who actually put together the conference, um, I actually taught him uh, <laughs> about cryptocurrency. Uh, so your friend who is an expert to you, learn from me. So I've, I've had that experience so many times. At this point, I just kind of laugh. But uh, yeah, it's, it's disheartening, but it happens. Anyway, it's Christmas in, in it's still July. It's Christmas in July. Mm. All y'all watching this, get this book, get, get it for yourself and get it for someone else yep. and start talking behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. Because of those of us who are in this sector are feeling some kind of way about, you know, all the studies we have, um, even Jamari Peterson, who, mm. who is, you know, basically all but dissertation mm. out of Carnegie Mellon, um, has said that when he's, he's cut, you know, ventures before this, Mm -hmm. When people perceived that he was working for someone white, it got even though it was his, yeah. it got more attention and more funding. Now that he's fronting his own venture, it's kind of like, well, you know, who are you? What kind of scam you're you're, you're running? Yeah. You know, we come from from all spectra spectrums from people with university degrees who work. I worked out in the dot com world, all kinds of things. But even you know, the self taught people, a lot of times they know exactly what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you have to, you mentioned a word earlier, urgency. We have to recognize that this is urgent, that we can multitask, that what's going on in terms of police brutality and... Yeah, we need to keep going in terms of... Yeah, we need to keep going in terms of... I can't hear you. Okay. That's better. Yeah, I okay, think yeah, we, we need to um, uh, recognize that there's there's urgency in terms of you know saving our lives and um, having changes within the justice system, but we have to multitask with other fingers on our hand and recognize <laughs> that there's a global economic shift that is occurring. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, even the platform that we're on, you know, they have no experience in this sector, no, none whatsoever. None. And yet they launched a, uh, wow, we've been spoken for an hour. That's my clock going. <laughs> uh, they've launched a uh, company registered out of the United States mm -hmm. and using all the buzzwords to kind of basically fake, they, fake it till they make it. And yet I've had several black people talk to me about, ooh, Libra, Libra, Libra. But five minutes ago, you know, a year ago, 
And even five months ago, and even five weeks ago, you didn't know anything about crypto, but you're talking about how Libra is going to be the next thing to the slight thread. <laughs> but they just got here. That's what media, that's what media does. Here. It convinces people that the fakes are real and the real are fake. And it, it sucks because, like I said, as a black person, everything the media says, you should be thinking opposite. Like, literally, whatever they say, do the opposite, and you'll have a good life. Like, to me, I've been doing it my whole life, and it's worked out pretty good. Whatever the media is talking about, do the opposite, and then see what happens, because I can guarantee you they're not giving you information early. They're not giving 100 million people the correct information. Think about that. People watch the news and think they're actually coming on TV and giving you pertinent information for now every day to millions of people. If that was the case, everybody would be doing what they needed to do. You know, by the time you get the news, it's too late. That's what I always tell people. By the time it hit the news, you already missed it. Uh, they are, they're just reporting on whatever happened or, you know, what may happen because of the results of that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, from a news standpoint, it does take a, it changes your way of thinking. And as somebody who's done the news daily, uh, I have seen a lot. I have seen literally wake, wake up in the morning and rules change. So, yeah, uh, we got to change that way of thinking. And once you do, Bitcoin and blockchain will make more sense, I think. Yeah, I think it's it also is an instance of it's not so much what they say as much as what they do. Mm -hmm. um, got the whole debacle of uh, uh, Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan, <laughs> you know, not very long ago claiming that Bitcoin was for drug dealers and and it's yep. a scam. And then, you know, not even a year later, they launched JP Morgan coin. So, you know, yeah. you went from saying that Bitcoin is a scam and it's for drug dealers. Then you went and actually created a product based on the technology. And then fast forward to the end of June and your ship gets busted for the largest, largest drug bust in U.S. history. Billion dollars. I want to know: Did they pay in cash, or did they pay in Bitcoin, <laughs> or JP Morgan coin? That's what I want to know. JPM coin, yeah, because I mean, they, exactly. they that flew exactly. way under the radar. Nobody's even talking about it. Play so. no, no one's no one's covered. But if you look back at the news, it was June. What was it June 18? Mm. June. It, the news didn't break until Fourth of July weekend. That's how. That's how they wanted to bury it. Yeah. You break it late and then one time people are on late. vacation. Mm -hmm. That a month, the month prior. In the port of Philadelphia, a ship owned by J.K. J.P. Morgan had 20 tons of coke. Was it cocaine? I think. Yeah, cocaine. And that's the one that got caught. That's what I always 20, tell people. That's the is. one that got caught. If you, if you get caught with a ton, then there's tons. There's way no, more. That's that's getting tons. through. Yeah. If you get Not caught with 20 ton, tons, the biggest drug bust in the United States history is, is not owned yeah. by J.P. Morgan. Mm -hmm. Whose CEO was the one that said that Bitcoin was from drug deals? I guess maybe he should know. Yeah, I was gonna say maybe I he used Bitcoin he to know. pay for it. <laughs> yeah, he probably he didn't use Bitcoin to pay for it. They know they use fiat. Oh, drug yeah. dealers use fiat. They mm -hmm. don't. They don't. They don't use no <laughs> cash. Is quicker. They oh, ain't got to look. You already know. Most of the buyers don't know anything about Bitcoin, so they can't even use it if they want yeah, it. To. Drop these bags but you off. You know what? Right, Segue into the uh, into the forthcoming cannabis industry mm. and their blockchain providers that are providing <laughs> access right. for people to do uh, app to door sales in the, for the forthcoming cannabis industry using Dash and and some other stuff. So so. You know, white people are making moves. We're watching them make moves, and mm. we're kind of staying stagnant. stagnant. So in that, I, I want to close by reminding people to reach out to you, get the book, get up to speed. It's still summertime. You're still summer reading. Uh, black mm. people, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I always say with black people in cryptocurrency all the time, <laughs> like, like, like tunnel vision, but it's Bitcoin in black America. You can oh, yeah. find it on Amazon. Oh, yeah. Get caught up. Shoot him a message. Shoot mm -hmm. me a message. Shoot. I mean, if there's a honestly, if there's a black person at this stage in this country that you you feel that you can't inbox, I mean, this is the early stage. We answering all questions because we I want mean, you to know we know what the heck we're talking about. I was gonna say, get it now so while we'll it's hot. Asking questions. <laughs> answer questions all the time, mm -hmm. um, and definitely help us out by you know letting people of means know. Look. They, they're, they're banding together and they've got, you know, a way where you can invest in up to 20 companies at one time and incubate an academic program uh, with the hub right now being at Howard University 
in mm. terms of build out a curricula. We've got that going opportunity right now for people to do that. It would end up helping um, Isaiah's uh, Black Chain Venture, which is, you know, really mm. do need an online resource, a go-to resource that you can just log in and do your pitch and uh, yep. be able direct to pipeline uh, to invest. talk directly oh, yeah. to, to, to investors and, and that sort of thing. Because we're, we're in dire straits across the board. 42 million people would be mm. the 11th largest African nation if we were a national occasion and we have no industry, no sector that, that is of our own. We have to get over it. Um, you recall the story, uh, there's a story, I, I live in central New Jersey, which is known as uh, stereotypically as uh, old folks and Asians. <laughs> it, <laughs> even though there's large black and Latino communities in this area, but we, we have a, definitely have a lot of Asian businesses and then there's a restaurant that's near me and I, my, my uh, my my dot com you know e-commerce thing there were some some products that i wanted to to merchant services that kind of merge web-based that i was pitching and as a young guy my age you know mm -hmm. i'm in my 40s so my my age who actually owns the restaurant that i go to and he says let me talk to you outside and he says you know what he says i love your presentation and i will tell you flat out that we're outside his restaurant Mm -hmm. customers everything inside you know, a few people pop the passes but there's nobody there he said i will tell you that i only do business with other uh he, i don't he's not korean he's um i want to say he's chinese i can't mm -hmm. remember whatever his ethnic group was but it's not it's not korean he yeah. said I only let's say it's chinese i only do business with other chinese and i know i'm paying too much i know i'm there but i feel protected yeah. And when he said it, I said, wow, I really wish black people were like this. And he's like, but he was Armenians, like, you know, keep pushing, Koreans, keep trying. Ethiopia, but it's yeah. it's great. But he said, honestly, and he actually, he added an addendum. It wasn't just Chinese. She said, he said, sometimes, he, he looks at me, sometimes you just got to do business with white people because there's nothing you can do. But when I yeah. try, if I'm doing things with purpose, I do it within my community. And I know I'm paying more. And the reason I know I'm paying more is I feel protected being a part of the collective versus not being outside of the collective. So we have to be mindful of that too, as and when we're talking about um, you know, you know, the blockchain ventures or any tech venture or any venture in general, that we need to come together as a community. It's not being it's been being racist, it's actually creating a, a, a protective element for your period yep. and you get a tremendous amount of res respect for that because it, his question to me was like why don't y'all do that but <laughs> I, I i am so tired of hearing that question from people because when you talk to black people the first thing they say is well we should be able to just do whatever because we're part of everything and then when you talk to immigrant communities or communities that are different they're saying like yeah we've been waiting for y'all to, to why don't y'all join up together why don't y'all do more you know what i mean because that's how we survived i don't know what y'all are doing and i'm tired of hearing that so Definitely, uh, this is the town. This is the industry, or one of the indus the biggest industries to get into Bitcoin and blockchain. Bitcoin and Black America out now. And I do want to point out uh, here on the back, there is a QR code uh, for a donation. That QR code is used for the Bitcoin Kids Camp, the first one ever in Charlotte, North Carolina, that I'll be leading. It's a Bitcoin Kids Summer Camp, uh, three weeks worth of camp where they'll learn about mining, blockchain art. Uh, they'll have Bitcoin wallets uh coding and uh as well uh so yes that is what those donations will be used for i do want to shout that out because that will be starting august 8th so once again like i said doing the work uh even if i write about it i want to make sure i'm actually doing something about it so between blockchain and doing the uh, bitcoin summer camp coming up august 8th uh those are two things i definitely want to point out hey that's in the, where is that again it is in charlotte north carolina it will be held at the main library downtown so uh, if you are in the Charlotte area or if you know people in the Charlotte area, that event uh, will be up tomorrow. The links uh, to that event will be up tomorrow. But yes, I want the first Bitcoin Kids Camp in Charlotte. I do want to remind people we were also the first company to have a booth at CIAA along with uh, Sinclair Skinner. So in my hometown of Charlotte, North Carolina, I have definitely done everything I can to bring Bitcoin uh, to that community. And this is just the, the latest. And they're still open the spots for anybody who has children in the age, what, what age groups? Absolutely, uh, from uh, fifth grade to 12th. Fifth grade to 12th, yep. great. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think someone trumped you. you you're gonna, probably end up gonna be se second. There was a camp that was going on last no. week on, I know on the West Coast. 
Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's right down the street. I know. <laughs> the thing is, I would say it's the first. It. It's the first in the Charlotte. First in uh, Charlotte, right? Yeah, it's the first one in Charlotte. Yeah, it's not the first, first one ever. Charlotte. However, I will say the one the crypto blockchain plug, the one in Inglewood, great camp. Uh, shout out to everybody. Uh, Najee, that was there. D, I was supposed to be there, but between book promos and running back and forth for business stuff to San Diego, I wasn't able to go this week. However, uh, some of the people who teach at the camp, I've been in discussions with them before that camp came along. So I don't care who does it first. I just know in my hometown, it's the third biggest banking city in America. So it's wow. almost impossible to convince the people there that there's an industry that's going to take away what built Charlotte, essentially. However, uh, that is what's happening. So that's why I wanted to focus in my hometown of Charlotte rather than out here. Because out here, there's another kids camp that's about to happen. Uh, it's just not as popular, well known. But out here, it's a lot of different camps that can go on in L.A., you know, North Cal South, uh, Southern California. But like I said, in North Carolina, in Charlotte, North Carolina, nobody is discussing that. It's a big banking industry. So I kind of want to hit it head on and, uh, you know, take on, you know, uh, you know, what has to be done to get the kids educated because I don't really care what adults have to say anymore. I'm done with adults to an extent. I am care about the kids because they're the ones that's going to build the industries that we're discussing. In, these, in this book, some of the solutions I have, they won't come until I'm old and gray. But whoever I'm telling it to is Okay, you froze a little bit. Um, we're probably coming to the end of this live stream, but it's a great freezing shot to have of his book, uh, Bitcoin and Black America, that is available on Amazon. Reach out to him as well um, about his the summer camp that's coming up in Charlotte, as well as um, his newscast. Gentleman of crypto that every single day we just lost him, but I it was a it was a great conversation. I usually do not do hour long um, live streams at all. I usually. Keep uh, in almost a year that I actually talked to him and he, as you can see he has a lot of things on his plate a lot of us that are in cryptocurrency have a lot of things on your plate you have you know your day job you you, you whatever you know you're doing to make revenue but you also have um, you know a lot of the ventures because once you're in the space there's a lot of ideas to start coming because it's a problem-solving technology so since it's a problem-solving technology once you understand how blockchain works um, then you start seeing, okay, what kind of solutions this can provide for the black community. So we just lost uh, Bitcoin Zay, also known as Isaiah Jackson. If you're looking for the book, it's Isaiah Jackson. And the book is um, Bitcoin and, and, and Black America. Um, so definitely look for it, share the book and share what we're doing. And we'll be back with everyone soon. Share this video, start the discussions, talking not only about um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and blockchain, but there are a lot of black innovators in the support that we need the support of our own community to help our businesses grow and to um, each one teach one as well. All right. Thanks, Courtney. I see all the messages from uh, Courtney and from uh, I think Monique was posting a lot. Clint, hi. Monique was, was, was chiming in about Howard and she ain't know black people. Um, like the ones we were talking about, and that's a good thing. Uh, we, um, unfortunately, and, and those of us that are in the technology space, and the same thing happened during the dot-com era as well. People who are in the technology space, if you're a black technologist, they think you're running a hustle, or they think you're not as smart as uh, Bitcoin Zay gave. <laughs> you know, he's been there since 2013. I don't think, I don't know if any of you had picked that up. That uh, Bitcoin launched in um, January of, January 10th of 2009. So, so to be in a space in 2013, there aren't that many people, um, white or black, can say that. So you're talking about someone who um, ha came from a teaching background, came from a technical background as an engineer, and then he came into the space, learned it, and started being an early consultant to a lot of white people, most of the white people in the space, as well as the black people in the space, and it's rare that you can find someone that has been at this that long. However, what we find is as time grows and spans and stuff, people forget that Black people exist. They forget our stories. There's already, there have already been, unfortunately, some, some looks like some tragedies of, of some black innovators that, you know, their ideas will live 
longer than they did in the companies that they started because they didn't have the support of black investors. They didn't have the support of the black community. And then you get the squeeze play. And it's not just uh, in blockchain technology that also existed in mainstream technology. And it also exists among white and white technologists and white. I mean, it's just something that uh, is, is exacerbated a lot more when you're black and you don't have uh, a fighting chance versus uh, when you're white and you can, you, can, you can come back from federal prison and uh, oh, there's, oh yeah, that's the other thing is, you know, people in the entertainment sector, there are a lot of people, a lot of stories uh, in, the, in the sector that we thankfully are not a part of, a lot of scandals, a lot of people who have, you know, were funded and went to federal prison, got out and are now refunded, but you know, that's white guy story. So um, yeah, I can see not what happened, but you know what, um, it, it just, you know, we're, Zay was on the West Coast and he, was under, he didn't know what happened. Everything went blank. Somehow or another, you got disconnected, but it was a great conversation. You know, we went on for like uh, over an hour, um, covered a lot of ground, a lot of your background. Uh, and people can look at this and share this and be able to uh, talk to their friends and their family and other people that know. But in any case, we've got to get our community up to speed. Some of the issues that we talked about that are not being addressed is the fact that the black press does not cover us. Um, in fact, you will find them doing more white stories or celebrities who make mention, and it's, it's not to say anything bad about Nipsey Hussle or Akon or anything like that, but honestly, or Proz, but honestly, but they're not linking with black technologists. So they are actually gone into Europe and everywhere else to do these strategic partnerships. So when you have black media covering them, um, it's kind of like an insult to black people who are in uh, in blockchain space, whether they're in the United States, in Uganda. I mean, and we have links across the board. Um, we will probably have him on again, um, uh, not just uh, Bitcoin Zay, but also have someone like uh, Sinclair Skinner on again to talk about the Black Blockchain Summit. That is an entirely black produced conference. The first conference was in 2018 in September at Howard University's campus. There were, uh, uh, Bitcoin Zay had come from California, but aside from people coming from around the United States, you know, you had um, uh, people in the blockchain space in Kenya co produced it. You had um, representatives from Uganda, from Ghana from um, Haiti, from Trinidad and Tobago, from, uh, you know, just, it, it was a wonderful thing to see that all of us that are in this space and developing and creating in this space, and unfortunately, whether they're in Africa proper or in the Caribbean or in the United States, if you're black, our story is exactly the same. No one invests in our businesses. No one um, calls us, whether it's from the black press or from the mainstream white press to get a quote or our opinions about anything, but we keep pushing. Bitcoin Zay and his partner, King Bless, they broadcast every single day. In the Eastern time is 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, West Coast time is around 3-ish, 3, 3 p.m. Eastern time, and they cover a lot of the news. And uh, unfortunately, when you tune in for the first time, you might not actually know what's going on, but they're extremely well-respected in you know doing being the longest continuous broadcast of technology news including all the white coverage as well um with the number of episodes that they've done um they basically break all the records so um you definitely want to even if you don't know what they're saying at least tune in to start jotting down some of the things that you can research using google and youtube and trying to catch up with some of the vocabulary and some of the companies that are being mentioned it's a whole uh, in, in Africa and Uganda, they call it the fourth industrial revolution. That's the brand name that they have. Uh, in the United States, uh, the forthcoming Black Blockchain Summit for the second conference is coming to Howard University. We call it uh, Reparations and Revolution uh, because it repairs things and it's also revolutionary. Um, so if you, you're not up to speed, you have to understand that in terms of black people, some of the things that we're addressing is a central banking system in the Caribbean and the central banking system in, um, in, uh, among African nations make it so that uh, in order that Nigeria wants to do business with Kenya or Trinidad with Jamaica, you have to go through 
a bank that's controlled by the United States, Canada, or Europe. That's how they keep, uh, basically keep the Caribbean and African nations colonial. They do it also in Asia as well. I call them, I call them for all the non-honorary white companies, countries. So it doesn't necessarily impact uh, South Korea and Japan as much. And obviously China is always doing its own thing, so it doesn't really impact them as much. But if you're in any other part of Asia, and that actually includes um, India, there's this, 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 this system that keeps you know, basically Europe wealthy. And you have to be mindful of that when, when this own platform, this company, um, Bitcoin, is trying to be the payment services provider for the world, and they market it as we're going after the unbanked. Well, the unbanked is code word for we're going after Africans, we're going after people in India, we're going back to people in Latin America, we're going after the same area, the same areas that we currently control with the uh, existing central banking system, we want to create a new central bank that these areas cannot provide their own companies to service within nations and among nations, they must go through us. And how we're going to do it is we're going to build this network of uh, a banking system. We're going to use the buzzwords of blockchain and cryptocurrency, but we're not really blockchain and cryptocurrency. And the major difference of true blockchain and cryptocurrency is that, that you can't keep someone like me from putting a computer in the system and making money. Now, Calibra, Calibra which is a Facebook system, won't allow me to do that. They only had written in their plan 100 validators. They currently have 28. All 28 are white companies. So you have a bunch of basically white companies who are telling you that they're going to market and help out the poor black people and the poor Latino people and the poor Asian people to help you do bank transactions. Never mind that a lot of these places, like uh, places in Kenya, or already have a lot of their own system in PESA. They already have their own system by their own banking system that allow them to do far more than we can do in the United States. They already have the phone apps that, you know, in the United States, we got phone apps that can get us some Dunkin' and some Starbucks. But they got the phone apps that can pay anybody. Taxi, cab, ride, or you don't have, they don't even walk around with cash. So the system that Calibra is promising already exists in India. It exists in Asia with Alipay. These are banking institutions within those respective company, countries that have created a mobile, um, you know, paying system. Uh, so now you have, um, you know, the United, the United States and Europe basically trying to outbrand them and will enter the market offering their service um, with no, for no transaction fees. So, you know, how you get people is say, I'll give it to you for free. But then once you have everyone marked and you've eliminated the, the indigenous systems, then you can go about and start tacking on the same fees and the same rules and regulations that you currently inhibit the commerce between African nations or between Africa and the Caribbean or between Africa and certain Asian nations without first going through Europe and things. And it would seem like everything, what's the big deal? What's the problem? Well, the big deal, what's the problem is central banking has historically um, basically been judge and jury and, uh, and prosecutor of... Uh, Caribbean and African and Asian businesses. So um, they they talk a lot about AML, AML uh, anti money laundering laws and KYC, know your customer, because they'll constantly say, well, we got to know who everyone is because you could be a terrorist. Or uh, we got to know, we got to know that you're following our rules and our regulations and using our system. Otherwise, we accuse you of money laundering. And what they do is they arbitrarily do that anyway. So they will arbitrarily will all of a sudden someone is doing, you know, in Canada and, and they, they're basically an expat from Jamaica and they're busy doing business. And all of a sudden it stops. It cuts off. And who did it? It was the bank. Why did it? Well, we noticed that you did an extra transaction this month. So that's not normally what you did last August so we accuse you of money laundering and there's no judge there's no jury there's no we're going to stop you for three months and then all of a sudden they say yeah well we did our research yeah you weren't money laundering you're fine but you've already hindered that black business owner 
Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be a black businesswoman as a white Jamaicans and everything, but you've already hindered the relationship with doing direct business directly with the Caribbean, directly with Kenya, directly with Nigeria, directly. And, and this is not puffery. At the last blockchain summit, we had the, uh, I always forget her name, which you can look her up, <clears throat> the African Union uh, um Women that works with the African Union talk about how within in, within Africa, especially she was giving Francophone countries as an example, whenever they get a progressive um, uh, leader that says, okay, well, you know, Africans, we need to start our own banking system, France will just freeze up the bank and won't let anybody have any money. And we see this nonsense also existing in, in Zimbabwe. Some of these, some of the th situations are indigenous problems. There are problems with corruption of leaders, but the corrupted leaders are, are further corrupted by, you know, European and American and Canadian banking systems that keep everyone colonial and keep everyone in check and keep Europe profiting off of, uh, you know, the areas that they've offered proper. So colonial is officially over, but not in the banking industry. And that's the reason why we say blockchain is important to know, because blockchain frees it up that... If Jamaica wants to do business directly with Trinidad or directly with Kenya, they can do it by way of the block because blockchains are designed to be automated and run by computers. So if you need revenue to go back to, to do, you know, certain shipping or whatever that you're, you're, you're doing, international business, it can, it can be done using the blockchain systems. And we expect a tremendous amount of pushback. We expect, um, we, we see coming down the pike, there are going to be a number of people that are going to say that, um, you know, don't use cryptocurrency. This cryptocurrency is illegal. We, we know, we already know it's coming. There's nothing wrong with the cryptocurrency, which is everything is run by machines and everything is automated. It doesn't have any feelings, doesn't have any prejudice, doesn't, doesn't really care. So we, we know that, you know, anybody can use it, but they'll say, don't, don't use it because, you know, drug dealers use it. Well, drug dealers use cash. Don't use it because it supports terrorism. Well, I don't see them freezing David Duke's account anytime soon. So, you know, yes, all these things are possible, but people don't think about that when they think about cash. They don't think about, okay, well, I'm going into my regular bank and I'm depositing a check or I'm making a withdrawal. And yet, also, that same bank accepts cash businesses, cash, cash, cash deposits all the time from businesses. I mean, if, you, if you've been behind, if you've ever had to go in the bank and actually get something serviced, you've been behind people that, are, are you saying that the banks are really doing due diligence as supposed to, that somebody's coming in with wads and wads of cans that have to run through the thing? They're not taking digital payments. They're not taking credit card payments. So they'll charge some people with you know, accusations of irregularities in terms of money laundering, but they don't do everybody like that. So you know there's a disproportionate in terms of people of color, people of color nations, that they're doing that and making a hindrance of versus, you know, people that are, look like them or look like, you know, people that wouldn't do any wrong or something like that within our, our everyday community. So we definitely say, like, look at it. It's free and opportunities. We've got a couple of people in our deck that are trying to solve the problem of Caribbean to Caribbean businesses, um, you know, without using banks and using cryptocurrency so business can continue and can thrive uh, between nations. And it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a battle. Um, but you have to know the entire dynamics of what is happening and why uh, the financial sector is very nervous about what is happening. So, leave you. It's been uh, an hour and a half, which is way... I haven't done an hour and a half live stream since our very first live stream. So, this will be probably the last one that's this long, usually tapping at 30 minutes. But I haven't done it in a couple of months, so everything needed to be said. So, let me leave you with the, that Isaiah Jackson's book was Bitcoin in Black America. It's available on Amazon. Um, spread the word about him, about his show, uh, about black people and cryptocurrency. To anyone who will listen, uh, we've got to get up to par. Other, We mentioned it earlier. Um, other communities do it. I mean, there's a lot of uh, South Korean shows that I tune into, and and they're South Koreans in the United, in the, in the United States, and they're talking about South Korean business in South Korea. So if we don't start talking about what our own, what our comp contributions are, how they impact the industries that we're currently excelling in in terms of entertainment, how do we build on that, um, then it's going to be our fault. It's, it's, not, it's not 
white person's not holding us down. We can't, we can't beg, uh, we can't beg, um, uh, Bloomberg and Forbes to get quotes from black people. We just can't do it, but we can hold our own to the fire, our own black enterprises, our own, um, black activity, wh whatever we're looking at and contact them and say, Hey, you know, how come you're not covering the sector? How come I don't know about the sector? How come I have to go to white media to figure out what the heck is going on in blockchain and cryptocurrency? Who are the black people who have companies who have lost companies? Cause that all well, that is happening right now. You know, why are you talking about, um, the people globally, whether it's in the United States or on the African continent and Caribbean and what they're producing. Why is everything about um, Libra, which essentially is just a bunch of people. So it's Facebook entering into a new line of business because their social media business is, is, is uh, needs some uh, uh, revenue stream. We can't depend on advertising model forever. Um, so it needs a new line of business, even if it's a separate company, to take advantage of transaction fees of you buying coffee at, at your local coffee shop, uh, or you're on vacation and you're buying coffee, or whatever. It needs those small micro transition transaction fees to be sustainable. Because um, I tell you, as a person who worked in the dot com media at a precursor to Facebook, the Globe dot com. Um, you know, uh, one of my former founders wrote an open letter to Facebook before they went public and told them, basically, I don't think it's a good idea that you have an IPO. And then do it because he's been on that dog and pony show. And we know that the re advertising street revenue stream is not sustainable. It's not sustainable to the rapid growth uh, and the cost of hosting everybody talking and video and everything. So I don't blame uh, Facebook, they have to go into a new industry. I just think they could create a much better product, a much better hybrid product. I mean, if you're going to found your company out in the United States, then go for broke, saying, look, we're going to have a Calibra. It's going to be validated, blah, blah, blah. But if you don't want to use it, you can use Dash in our system, too. You can use Bitcoin in our system, too. And this is an extra little track, uh, convenience fee that we're going to tap onto that because you want to use other cryptocurrency. So if you're going to go into the blockchain and crypto space, you need to go all the way into the blockchain and crypto space, not come out with a reinvention of the bank, which basically, if you were concerned about them uh, listening and privacy and using social media, then be very, it'd be even more concerned that they're tracking how you're spending your money. And it seems like it's trivial because he's like, ah, I'll jump in and take a Uber on uh, this. I don't care if Libra knows this. Yeah, well, they're also going to know when you buy, when, when you go to your doctor's office and all of a sudden you make a, a, ba a bigger purchase than you ever did the year before at, at a pharmacy, pharmacy also. And now all of a sudden you start seeing ads for treatment of some condition and you're like, how do they know about I have this condition? Oh wait, I use Libra to pay the prescription to clear up whatever this is. now because now now you're gonna be really concerned about the privacy issue, but then that you're already tracked, you're already in the system. So, you know, you have to think of, of those terms when they do come up with your product. Is that really what you wanna use? Or do you wanna use a cryptocurrency that's run by a machine and it really could care less? Uh, what you're spending or not, it's not going to serve you an ad the next day, you know, because, you know, you bought a bag of potato chips and now all of a sudden they, somebody else wants you to buy a different bag of potato chips, not tracking you to that capacity. And I can understand sometimes it's convenient to be tracked because you might be searching for something, searching for something. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that when we do research in um, cryptocurrency, it's a convenience that Google is spitting back some suggestions for because it puts me in a different direction in terms of coding and learning new material but there's other times that you don't want something spit back and you want to have that option and cryptocurrency gives you that option to do commerce with uh different businesses and not be tracked because it's a machine it does not it's not thinking in terms of serving you uh some type of competitor product or anything like that it doesn't it doesn't have any feeling or emotion about what you're buying altogether it just performs the task that you want send it to this vendor and i get my coffee and they don't have to ever know that i've been cheating on starbucks and cheating on dunkin donuts but going to this mom and pop that accepts uh dash or litecoin or something like that since i'm holding on to my bitcoin so except in this all i know is they get their money and I get my coffee 
and that's the end of the story. So just some notes to think on, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. I think maybe uh, as we get closer to um, Black Blockchain Summit coming at Howard University in September, we'll bring Sinclair back on to give us an update of what's changed from last year to this coming year. But other than that, we're going to continue with uh, Black People Cryptocurrency. If you're not a member of the group, please join it and uh, start talking to people about asking some questions. Um, I don't moderate. I moderate the group, but it's not, you don't get hemmed up in a, in a post that has to go to a minute approval. You know, I do keep, there's a strict set of rules that you're warned on if you're not, if you don't come in and read the rules and then do something that's out of scope of the rules, you see the post is either deleted and you're told about it if you keep repeated, repeatedly doing that. But um, I like the way that it's come across. You know, people, you know, I don't even have to go there and people are just constantly talking and learning from one another and that's the way the form is supposed to be. So uh, we'll see you soon. Definitely check Isaiah Jackson's book, uh, Bitcoin in Black America, and we'll talk again soon. Bye.